For Crema Media's Polity, I'm Shannon Durehove. The autobiography of Peter Hain traces his extraordinary career from anti-apartheid campaigner to British cabinet minister in Blair and Brown's governments. He joins me now to discuss his autobiography. Some have interpreted the title of your autobiography, Outside In, as indicative of your persona as a, quote, political misfit. Would you care to comment on this interpretation? I don't accept that description, but what it signifies is the unique role and experience that I have of being a South African boy mm -hmm. brought up in Pretoria, the son of two very brave anti-apartheid struggle activists in the late 1950s and early 1960s who were imprisoned and then issued with banning orders and then we were forced into exile. So I came from that campaigning background, I led the anti-apartheid movement in Britain, particularly focusing on sports tours, mm -hmm. stopping the Springbok matches in 1969-70, forcing white South Africa into isolation, from which she do did not return until after the transition. Mm -hmm. And that made a decisive impact on the anti-apartheid struggle. So from that background, then finding myself a member of parliament in the 1990s and a government minister and a cabinet minister in Tony Blair and Gordon Brown's uh, governments for 12 years. That was, um, it, as it were, coming from the outside uh, and then finding yourself on the inside, hence the title, Outside In. Now, as you mentioned, you were born in Kenya and spent your early years in South Africa. How did your African heritage help or hinder your career in British politics? Well, in some ways, it was a novelty. I would have thought it wasn't really an advantage because the British political culture is quite conservative mm. with a small c, whatever party you're in. And therefore, to come from an African background, um, I happened to be born in Kenya, but my, both my parents were South African born, my mother from Grahamstown, my father from Durban, and my childhood was spent in South Africa. I just happened to arrive as a baby when they were working in, uh, in Nairobi. And that's an unusual background. So for instance, to then find myself as a African minister, and Tony Blair appointed me in 1999, and I served there for two years as the British African minister, the only one ever to have been born in Africa. I think that brought a different perspective. Mm. And so I have always found in government in Britain and in politics in Britain that I have a different perspective. I'm not saying it's better or worse than anybody else, but I've always been impatient for change and for making a difference. Mm. And I don't, didn't go to parliament just to be a prominent MP or because of the status or the nice office uh, or the reasonable salary or anything like that. I went in to make a difference, to make a change, as I had in the anti-apartheid struggle and in other campaigns uh, earlier on in my, uh, in my 40 years plus uh, ex you know, activity in politics. So it, it's not a, a hope or a hindrance, but it's, it's just a different take on, on things. I found fellow political activists or fellow um, MPs or fellow government ministers have a, a different perspective from that which I do. Most South Africans associate your name with the sports boycott against apartheid. Why was this important to you at the time? And how effective do you think sports isolation was in bringing an end to the apartheid system? Well, I remember being called public enemy number one in the South African media and by South African government ministers and politicians who supported apartheid in the late 60s and early 70s because nobody had before then used the tactics of direct action to impose the sports boycott. Up until then, there had been very good campaigns lobbying to exclude white South Africa from the Olympics, from cricket, rugby, football and so on. But what I did was brought the experience and the tactics of direct action, of running on the pitch to stop the rugby matches, of putting the Springboks under siege in their hotels. Uh, for instance, in one occasion we booked a young woman into their hotel in London and she went around in the middle of the night and injected a solidifying agent into the door locks of all the players. So on the, this is the night of the international at Twickenham and they had to break their doors down to get out. So we did a lot of things like that and eventually what that meant is we heavily disrupted the, the matches uh, of the Springboks, it's never happened before. Mm -hmm. And then the pressure that that caused led to the cancellation of the cricket tour later uh, in the summer of 1970, a white cricket tour coming from South Africa to Britain. And when that happened, 
uh, it propelled white South Africa into sporting isolation. And Nelson Mandela told me when he came out of prison, as did Governor Mbeki, uh, that uh, they, um, they felt at that stage in the late 60s and early 70s, when it was a very dark period for the resistance against apartheid, the leadership was locked up in Robben Island. The resistance had been crushed. It was not until the Soweto uprising in 1976 that the, the pressure for change began to emerge again in South Africa. But in this period especially, the sports boycott was absolutely crucial because it dealt a decisive blow against the supporters of apartheid because, as we all know, uh, fanaticism for the Springboks amongst the white community in South Africa. And I know because I was a white South African boy myself. I was a fanatical uh, rugby, football and cricket supporter and still am. Mm. Uh, and so I understood uh, how, it, how important it would be. And remember the boycott movement, although it was aggravating on the economy and culture and in politics to the, to the apartheid government, the sports boycott was the only one that we really won and that was why it had such a decisive impact at this crucial period and then right the way through the 70s and 80s until eventually it became not a stick with which to beat apartheid but a carrot for the transition mm -hmm. and the negotiations then happened with um, Danny Craven the, the, the leader of the Springboks and other sports leaders like Ali Bacher from cricket with the ANC in the process of transition. Uh, so sport became a very important process of change when change was possible. At the time we imposed the boycott and big age of the demonstrations, uh, at that stage um, there was no negotiation. The apartheid government was crushing the ANC but they were forced to negotiate with them. In my own case um, that did mean a lot of uh, attacks on me. I received a letter bomb from the South African Security Services. Um, similar letter bomb to the ones which killed Ruth First in Maputo and other ANC leaders. Fortunately, my one had a technical fault. Otherwise, I wouldn't be giving this interview uh, to you. And there were a number of other attacks. They uh, framed me for a bank theft, which I didn't know anything about in 1975, and was committed by somebody who looked very like me, and almost certainly a South African agent. And that caused me a lot of aggravation. But, you know, there was a small price to pay for the victory which we achieved uh, later on. You note in the conclusion of your book that your political mission remains unfulfilled. Please elaborate on this statement. Well, I was able to have the privilege of serving for 12 years in a Labour government in Britain. And we brought about tremendous change. For instance, as regards Africa, I led the campaign as a government minister to get the, the international treaty agreed which established the ban on blood diamonds. Diamonds coming from uh, conflict zones as they were then, Sierra Leone, Angola, the Congo, and now actually Zimbabwe, uh, which were then used to purchase armaments in those days in the 1999, 2000, 2001, uh, and eventually we stopped that. Uh, so I was always able to make a difference, but at the end of that government period, I didn't want my book to be the diaries of an old man who's you know, had his day. I still think there's a lot I want to do. I want to help South Africa. Uh, I have met quite a few people during this visit. I want to help um, change in Britain. I remain a member of parliament. I'm lucky enough to represent the, the fantastic um, parliamentary constituency of Neath, which is a rugby stronghold as well as being a former coal mining area with active mining in it at the moment. Uh, so I work very hard there and I want to see a Labour government again in Britain because la a Labour government is the only government that really helps the people, like my constituents, and also has a, a fine track record of helping African countries including South Africa. So then what's next? Well, what's next? Uh, I don't know. I will continue to work for change. I've just uh, been out in uh, South Africa on the delegation to study the really, really rampant rise, which is extremely serious, of TB mm -hmm. uh, and um, its co-infection with HIV. And since the change of policy, thank goodness, from the South African government a few years, uh, from, a process, from a one of denial about HIV mm -hmm. AIDS, to one of actually uh, tackling the problem and a new health minister who's fantastic in his drive uh, and expertise. 
Um, there's, the HIV AIDS issue has been recognized and there's lots of focus on tackling it, however difficult it still remains. But T TB hasn't been neglected. And TB, as I've discovered, is, a f on the f is a rising at a frightening rate in South Africa, in the gold mines. It's a very big problem in the gold mines and elsewhere. And what happens is people leave their migrant workers especially, they get infected maybe around their place of work. Then they go home and then they infect their wives, they infect their sons, their daughters. And then they come back and it's, it's, it's just bal ballooning and there's not enough focus been on it. And this is the next cause, so I hope I can help uh, um, in that. And there'll be lots of other things for me to, to do in the struggle for international justice. Well, thank you so much, and I wish you all the best for the future. It's a pleasure. Donate now and give 15 rand a month. SMS JOIN to 41486.